Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the fourth of our online London lectures for the spring term. My name is Professor Dylan Edwards, and I'm Pro Vice Chancellor for the Faculty of Medicine and Health Sciences at UEA. Tonight's speaker is Christy Sanderson, a professor in UEA's School of Health Sciences and a chair in Applied Health Research. Before we hear from Professor Sanderson on her research, I'd like to give you a brief update on some recent happenings at UEA. On the 18th of May, UEA Health and Humanities Network and UEA Latin American Studies Network present a research forum and book launch event for A COVID Charter, A Better World. Author Professor Toby Miller and guest speakers will discuss how should we reconstruct our societies, environments, cultures and economies in the anticipated wake of the pandemic, a world after COVID. Uh, the 28th, the, sorry, the 20th of, of May marks International Clinical Trials Day. How do clinical trials work and why are they important? Which trials are happening in the NHS in Norfolk right now? How can you help us as a patient, a carer or, or a member of the public? Join an online talk on Incredible Medical Norfolk, the best bits of clinical research in our region, hosted by Dr. Polly Ashford of the Norwich Clinical Trials Unit at UEA. Details will be posted in the chat. As some of us step out once again into the variable spring weather to enjoy events in person once again, others are taking things more slowly. The good news is that many public events offered by UEA continue to, to offer research and education in an online format, which can be accessed from the relative safety of home or via mobile devices. Even from a park bench, if the weather's nice. Once again, UEA researchers will be taking part in the Worldwide Pint of Science Festival from the 17th to the 20th of May. The festival, which traditionally takes place in pubs and cafes, will instead broadcast nearly 70 live online shows from the Pint of Science YouTube channel, exploring topics from the circus act of defying gravity to hijacking the immune system. UEA uh, was one of uh, only a handful of universities in the UK to work to be able to launch COVID-19 testing, PCR-based testing, and we did this with our uh, Norwich Research Park partners, the Earlham Institute, the Norfolk and Norwich University Hospital and the Quadrum Institute, uh, way back in uh, early 2020. And since 2020, we carried out 15,000 PCR-based tests in in, uh, on the Norwich Research Park, intercepting a large number of, of, of COVID cases and preventing spread into the community. And indeed, the lab in the Bob Champion building has been working continuously seven days a week since, since that time, supporting the NHS. Uh, since December, we've been running lateral flow testing uh, 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 on campus for all of our students and staff. And since last week, UEA has been running a second lateral flow testing centre in the Students' Union Union's Blue Bar. Drop-in appointments will allow for quick tests for those who haven't booked an appointment in the main lateral flow testing area uh, um, uh, at the, located in the UEA Sports Park. Um, it's hoped that this additional testing centre will encourage more people to take up testing and even to make it a part of a regular routine in the drive to keep our UEA's community safe. And do remember, you need to take two lateral flow tests a week to, to, to be working on campus. Finding that all important work life balance in times of crisis and disruption is an issue perhaps more important now than at any other time in the university's history. And this applies to students and staff alike, which brings me to Professor Christy Sanderson's research. Christy joined UEA in January 2017 as chair in applied health research in the School of Health Sciences. She's a psychiatric epidemiologist and has been a registered psychologist earlier in her career. Professor Sanderson's research program is addressing an NHS priority area on how to attract and retain a workforce of the future through improving the way that we support staff and learners in the health and social care, social care system. Christy leads the Workforce Sustainability Research Group of UEA Health and Social Care Partners and is deputy lead for the NIHR Applied Research Collaboration East of England Mental Health Over the Life Course theme, 
where she leads the workforce wellbeing work stream. Tonight we'll hear from Christy how the 24-7 world of healthcare sees NHS staff routinely working through the night. This type of working isn't normal for humans and some people never truly adapt. In this lecture, Professor Christy Sanderson will explain, explore how we can keep staff and patients safe using the latest in sleep science, from chronotype matched shift scheduling, hard to say, to wearable bright light therapy. Please join me in giving a warm virtual welcome to Professor Christy Sanderson. Great, thanks very much, Dylan. Hard to say and hard to do when it comes to chronotype shift scheduling, but we'll get into that. So it's wonderful to have you with us this evening. Uh, I'll be talking from my perspective, coming from my mix of background of psychology and epidemiology, um, which takes a broad public health view of how we can help the sleep health of our health and social care workforce. I'll just share my slides for you and we will get into it. Great, so what we wanna talk for the next uh, 40 minutes or so um, is I wanna share with you uh, my research on how we're trying to make sure we're using the latest technologies and innovations in sleep science for our health and social care staff. But I've got two guiding questions that are really important in terms of how I frame my research and the sorts of um, ways I investigate this problem. I think it's really important to understand whether sleep disruption and fatigue at work is an inevitable part of health and care work. There seems to be a kind of inertia or acceptance that it's gonna be fairly awful to work lates or nights and that we just kind of have to learn to adapt. So I wanna kind of take us through that assumption and challenge it and see, is that really the best we can do for our health and social care workforce? And I also wanna keep in mind the different needs of people who are in that workforce. And I want to flag our future professionals here, so our students and learners, and keep in mind what should we be teaching our future professionals about working nights and working the often long shifts that are common um, within the health and social care sector. I'm going to give a little bit of background, just a couple of slides on how I've got into this and using the ambulance sector within the NHS as a case study. I think it talks broadly to the challenges within the NHS, but also thinking about environments outside of hospitals, where it perhaps it's a little bit more challenging to think about how we can do some of the work modifications or offer some of the supports for staff that can help them stay alert on shift. We're of course in a different world now with the pandemic, but to understand the impact it's had and what we need to do going forward, we need to understand what the situation was like before COVID enveloped us. So I'll take you through some data on what it was like um, before we entered pandemic conditions. Then of course, the all important question of what can we do about it? So again, coming back to this public health or systems approach to fatigue and sleep management, we'll run through what that means, what it looks like. Should we be looking to other industries to find out what can we actually do in NHS and social care? And because it's Mental Health Awareness Week, I hope you've managed to get out to nature or even sat by your pot plants this week. The theme is nature and mental health. I'll finish with just a couple of slides, um, drawing your attention to the very strong link between sleep and mental health. And almost if you're thinking about supporting people who've developed mental health challenges, you have to think about sleep as well. And I'll show you some data on why that's the case. So a bit of background on how I ended up doing this. I've been doing workplace mental health research or looking at the health and well-being of workforces for more than 15 years now. But I'm living and breathing how we can improve the work experience for the health and social care workforce at the moment. It is the main focus of my work. I was very lucky to be able to attend a fantastic event a few years ago now which is bringing together a number of countries looking at ambulance services across the world to try and have a look at how we could share, share best practice on how we support the mental health and well-being of staff who work in the ambulance sector. So obviously paramedics and other clinicians are an important part of that, but we need to think broadly across the whole workforce, people who work in supporting roles, kind of back of house functions, people in the control room. There's a whole diversity of people we need to think about and how we can support their mental health and well-being. 
And as part of this work, we were tasked to have a look at what sort of evidence there was in each of our countries to support the sort of work we might go forward with with this group. So we did a bit of work just to see, well, what do we know about the health and well-being of the ambulance workforce in the UK? And one thing that really stood out for me was the absence of research on sleep and fatigue. This was surprising because we do have a reasonably good evidence base for other health professionals, and we do have some good evidence from other countries about people working in the ambulance sector. But we had only one small study in the UK, which we thought was quite a gap. Because again, if we're thinking about the health and well-being of a workforce, sleep really has to be up in the top of your list in thinking about how you can protect and promote good well-being. So our first study we embarked on in this space was to really get a handle on what are we dealing with in terms of sleep and fatigue amongst staff in the NHS ambulance sector. We already know that fatigue is well rec recognised more broadly across the NHS, but it's often the staff themselves or the professional bodies who are lobbying and advocating the change to happen in terms of how staff sleep health is supported and how fatigue is managed. We've got some great examples that have come um, from the anaesthetists, uh, from the British Medical Association in terms of supporting junior doctors, but we need to think across our whole health and social care workforce because what works on an acute ward to support staff alertness may not necessarily translate to someone who's doing an overnight shift in a care home, for example. So we need to think broadly across all our opportunities for intervention. And I'll just flag here, um, I think one of the most fantastic um, advocates in this space at the moment is Mike Farquhar. If you're interested at all in sleep health and sleep in NHS staff, um, do follow him on Twitter. Uh, you'll get an almost daily dose of uh, tips and, and important information for how you can stay safe at work and how you can support your colleagues as well. So coming back to what do we know about this particular setting of ambulance? Been very fortunate in my work to come across um, a colleague, John Rogers, who's a paramedic. He has a very powerful personal story of how fatigue at work impacted him. And he's written a really informative um, and very, I think, challenging for us case study on how we're responding to fatigue in staff. He was coming back from a shift that had overrun. Those of you who are from the ambulance sector who are, who are listening will, will find this scenario very familiar. He was out of area, coming back, um, it had been already a very long shift and he experienced a micro sleep behind the wheel and had a vehicle accident. He beautifully describes how the system needs to do much better in terms of managing, providing high quality and timely emergency and urgent care, but not pushing staff beyond their limits, not pushing them to the brink so that they become unsafe at work. And managing that balance is actually quite a job and quite a challenge. And that's the area where we really think we need to kind of unpack what we can do, how we can make that change happen and what's feasible and how do we actually achieve that balance that promotes both high quality patient care and safety, but also keeps our staff safe as well. So we did uh, the first study in the UK looking specifically at sleep and fatigue in ambulance staff using some clinically validated measures. This was a cross-sectional snapshot look and we really wanted to sort of explore patterns of clinical fatigue and poor sleep quality. We wanted to have a look at what could we do differently with this workforce to help their sleep and reduce fatigue. And we were also quite interested to see whether strategies that have been tried in ambulance services in other countries are going to have any applicability or relevance to the NHS. So we've got a decent sized group of participants for this study, which has allowed us to look at it in some detail. And our group was representative of the workforce broadly in terms of demographics and people who work in the ambulance workforce. Just some terminology here. Um, these are the measures we use to look at sleep quality and also at fatigue. So sleep quality, things like your subjective um, rating of, of how you felt you've been sleeping, 
because objective measures are really good, but we all respond differently to six hours sleep or four hours sleep or disrupted sleep. So getting the personal insights on how a person's sleep is being affected and how they're experiencing it is really important. And it covers things like the actual number of hours um, and whether you've had any sort of disruptions to the night um, and also whether you're experiencing any consequences from that. So having trouble staying awake while driving um, or having stay, staying awake through other activities, which can include eating or engaging in sort of social activities. And when we talk about fatigue, we're talking about both mental and physical fatigue. But what's interesting with our group of participants here is that it was often that mental fatigue that was coming through most strongly. And that's really important indicators for a health professional. Difficulty concentrating and memory, two key cognitive skills that you need to provide high quality care. So headline results. Top one there. Of our nearly 700 participants, 78% reported poor sleep quality. So that's the measure about disrupted sleep, not getting enough hours, potentially falling, um, feeling fatigued enough to feel like you could fall asleep at the wheel. Nearly 70% reported severe fatigue amongst those who were working overnight shifts. But interestingly, we saw quite a high um, rate in day workers as well. So when we're talking about promoting sleep health, of course, we think of shift works and those who work long shifts overnight. But actually, the issue of fatigue is quite high amongst day workers as well. So people who never work late nights or overnight. So we need to think holistically about a workforce and what their different needs are. We saw a very striking result of poor sleep habits, especially under those who were 30 years of age. Um, I know some of you are probably thinking, where's the surprise there? But I just kind of want to show you the measuring and so you can have a little chance to have a think about kind of your own sleep habits and see how you feel you benchmark against our workforce. So these are some of the items we used in our survey to help people think about their habits. These are all things that have been known to impair your ability to get a good night's sleep. And if you're working nights or work late, I want you to think about how this resonates with you and whether, whether you feel some of these are actually unavoidable. So it's things like taking daytime naps lasting two or more hours. So that's a significant nap. Going to bed at different times from day to day, those of you who are on rotating schedules, so you might move from days to nights, of course that's unavoidable because of the nature of your shift. Staying in bed longer than you should two or three times a week. On your day off, you're looking to catch up your sleep. I think this one really, really need to think about. Going to bed feeling stressed, angry, upset or nervous. If you've come off a long shift where you might have had some challenging incidents, you might have had a long commute home, it can take you some time to wind down. So we need to think about how we can help people both when they're preparing to go on an overnight shift, but also what they do when they come off shift. And there's some practical things, which again, I think can really affect shift workers. You come home to a noisy, bright house. How well can you actually get in to catch up on some sleep when you've come off a night shift? So these are the sorts of things we're talking about when we talk about sleep habits. So back to kind of, we've scoped out the problem. We've seen that there is substantial issue with poor sleep quality and fatigue in this workforce. Interestingly, this parallel results we've seen in other sectors in the NHS, it's similar to levels of fatigue we've seen in doctors, in A&E nurses in the UK, for example. So what sort of consequences might we see from that? 60% of staff reported they arrived on shift with an inadequate rest beforehand. So not that working those long shifts is making them, them tired. They're already starting with a handicap. They're turning up on shift tired. We saw in our study that severe fatigue was increasing the risk of being injured at work and people reporting that they felt unsafe on scene in terms of unsafe in their clinical care. But there was a lot of positives to take away from this study as well. 50% of staff said they're already trying to do things at work to stay alert. So we need to understand that to say, are they doing things that have good evidence behind them? What can we learn from the actions they're taking that we could perhaps share with other workforces? Nearly 60% of staff, staff put their hand up to say, I do want help with my sleep. 
what are we doing in terms of the support offered um, through your trust or your social care uh, workplace? What's being offered to staff in terms of, of, of signposting even at a minimum to support for their sleep health? And interestingly, in a parallel project where we looked across all of the staff health and wellbeing policies in the NHS ambulance sector, sleep was hardly ever mentioned um, and no trust in England had a fatigue policy. So this does seem to be some gap, even though it's hugely recognised that this is an issue, in terms of tackling it proactively and head on, we do need to do some work. And of course, we see technology creeping in here. While technology can contribute to poor and disrupted sleep, there is a potential to use it for good, even if it's at a minimum tracking your sleep to understand um, where you might be able to, to, to make some improvement in your own sleep patterns and behaviour. So coming back to what are staff doing on shift to stay alert, again, I think it's important to look at this across different parts of the NHS because what staff can do can be quite different. You can see here amongst our ambulance staff, we had a lot of low tech, very easy things that they can do in a control room while they're out in a vehicle. It's things like keeping each other going through humour or banter. Of course, there's caffeine and energy drinks in there trying to get some fresh air to make you feel alert, listening to musical radio and just moving about, physically moving yourself to try and get rid of that feeling of tiredness. Also common to be on your phone, so messaging friends or family, using social media. We also saw some things that we know are common but are perhaps less helpful. High sugar foods, 40% of staff were using that sugar hit to keep going trying to get access to light, taking a brief nap. Now, this is one that was less common in our workforce than we might see in other parts of the NHS. And it's simply because of the nature of the work. Unless you're back at base or unless you work in a physical building where you can get access to that restroom, um, it can be difficult to negotiate how you can actually have a nap. But for me, this is one of the really important evidence-based strategies that we need to work out. How can we actually get this evidence-based helpful practice, more widely recognised and supported within the NHS. And I very much include the patient and public view of this as well. If a member of the public uh, sees a paramedic having a micro nap in their ambulance while they're parked and shift waiting for a job, that should be accepted and supported. Uh, not people taking photos of a, a napping para paramedic as if this is some terrible thing. So we've got a bit of a public conversation as well to bring the public and also users of ambulance services and other parts of the NHS with us. I think some of the more powerful stories for me came when we sat down and did some in-depth interviews with staff to get their kind of, I guess, real world stories about what they felt contributed to their fatigue and the consequences for themselves in terms of when they kind of were feeling really fatigued, what impact did that have on them? So it's going to be, again, no surprise to any, any of you who are actually working in the NHS, system demand came up as contributing to fatigue, shift patterns and late finishes, absolutely. But also, of course, your busy lives. Do you have kids? Do you have health conditions yourself that are impacting on your sleep? And driving, because this was an ambulance service. So things to consider is not just the nature of the roads they're driving on, so are they poorly lit, are they rural, but also the length of the commute. We have many ambulance staff who live quite a distance from where they're based. They may have had a 12 hour shift that turned into a 14 hour shift, and then they may have a 30 to 60 minute or more drive home at the end of that shift. What are we doing to support staff and help them stay safe once they've come off an incredibly long, often intense and exhausting work shift? How are we helping them get home safely? When we think of the consequences of fatigue, of course, we think of care quality. Are staff safe? Are patients safe? But our study participants also highlighted some really important impacts on their broader life. Lack of opportunities to participate socially, so catching up with family and friends. We had staff who reported they were using their annual leave to catch up on sleep. Do we consider this acceptable in a modern NHS? I would hope the answer to that is no, but what can we do to help change this culture? 
long-term feelings of fatigue itself can really wear you down and contribute to kind of low mood, not feeling yourself and also becoming run down and developing sickness. So we've got quite a range, a broad range of effects that we need to consider both to, to try and prioritise managing fatigue, but also to think about how we can actually promote a good overall quality of life for staff while still maintaining that high care quality. So this is what it was like before COVID. You can see we're starting from, um, in some ways, quite a shocking scenario for NHS staff, and you overlay a pandemic on top of that. The short answer is we don't know the full effects yet, but there are some large scale longitudinal, longitudinal studies that are following people over time to understand what the impact was and importantly, what the potential longer term consequences might be. But what we do know when the pandemic first hit in those first few months, support for sleep was amongst the top reasons for NHS staff for accessing help. From our own work we conducted during the pandemic with the ambulance sector, we found that the need for better sleep rated higher than secure access to PPE, worries about redeployment to other parts of their work or the NHS, and even worry about family. So it became even more of an issue um, during the acute response phases of the pandemic. There's also some unique aspects um, about dealing with a pandemic that are going to contribute to fatigue, whether it's that added exhaustion from long shifts, but with stress and anxiety on top of it, stress and anxiety for themselves, but also for what they might be bringing home to their family. Again, those of you who are listening in, who've had particularly to wear the full PPE will know it can be hot and exhausting. If you're turning up to shift, tired and exhausted, getting all that gear on again, it's just another exacerbating feature. And of course, we do know that some staff um, have understandably really struggled with their mental health during the pandemic. And this can also um, trigger feelings of exhaustion and disrupted sleep. So coming back to our key questions. A lot of this is not new. We're understanding it in more detail. We've seen it in other countries. How can we sort of understand this inertia in why things haven't changed? And we're now going to move into what we can actually do and what are some of the evidence-based strategies that we need to work out? How do we get those into the NHS and social care? And again, thinking about what does all this mean for how we prepare our future healthcare professionals? I'm going to kick off this conversation about what can we do better by a quote from one of our paramedics in our study, because I think it sums it up beautifully. Other workplaces actively get staff to consider their fatigue levels as it is considered a risk and gave the example of the airline industry. We could also talk about transport or mining. The trust should start recognising fatigue as a risk and managing it in the way that these other high risk industries do. So how easy would that be to have an aviation style fatigue management approach in the NHS? Let's have a look about what we actually mean by that. When we talk about a systems approach to fatigue management, we're really thinking very broadly about all of the reasons why someone could turn up to shift fatigued, why they could develop fatigue on shift. As our participants told us through our surveys and interview work, we need to think holistically about their full lives, their private life, their working life to understand how we can actually minimise risk that staff will turn up on work, work exhausted, but also how we can not make it worse for them while they're on shift. And there are three key types of strategies we need to consider. And as we're going through these, I want you to think about how, to what extent have you seen these in operation in the NHS or social care? If you work in that setting or you have done or you're studying to work in that setting and you've been on placement, what have you seen in terms of health and social care workplaces trying to manage fatigue and support sleep health? So let's start firstly with predictive strategies. This is really where we're trying to work with our latest understandings of human sleep biology to say, do we have to accept people getting tired 
when they're working overnight. It's not natural for humans, most humans anyway. There's a tiny proportion who thrive working overnight permanently, but they're rare. How can we actually design our shifts better to make sure we're taking into account an individual's personal sleep biology? We can talk broadly about risk prediction. It's harmful to do too many nights in a row. But what are we learning from sleep science that might actually help us personalise that in unique and interesting ways? And is that even feasible in the NHS, given the complexity of rosters we have to work with anyway? So that's the first thing we need to be looking at. Proactive is where we try and promote good sleep habits, like that list I showed you before. But also, how can we help staff identify when they're developing a sleep disorder or understanding the impact that other health conditions they may have developed is impacting on their sleep and feelings of fatigue? And how are we reflecting that through the support for staff health and wellbeing that trusts and social care providers are offering? So these are kind of our first two lines of defence. Even if we did all of those perfectly, there's still going to be times when staff are turning up on shift, tired and exhausted. We saw that was 70% in our ambulance study. How can we get that number down? And our reactive strategies are seeing what can we actually do when people are on shift to identify dangerous fatigue, either when they turn up for shift with dangerous levels of fatigue or develop it during a long shift. And what can we actually do to help support staff to take advantage of strategies where there is an evidence base um, that we can actually get more of that in practice? So let's have a little think about this. I think within the NHS, there has been no time like the present to start thinking about clever biologically based rotors. If any of you who are listening to this have designed rotors, you're probably thinking, no, it's hard enough as it is to manage the complexity of fulfilling all the shifts every day. But I think science has moved on now and there are now excellent technologies to help us actually build these features into rotors. And with the e-rostering initiative that's been running in the NHS, where ideally within the next couple of years, every person working in the NHS will have their rosters done through an e-system. We have a real opportunity to see how we can get this science into the rostering process itself. One thing I want to flag is how we can use chronotype here. Many of you will know what that means. Are you naturally a morning person, an evening person, a very late evening person, or you have no preference? Most of you will intuitively know um, where you fall into it, but there's some nice little tools you can do online to check your chronotype. This is a feature of someone's biology. We're working against it at the moment by having these standard rotors that we just apply to everyone across the board. What if we actually worked with our own sleep biology to try and match people better to their rosters at work? It's been trialled experimentally uh, in a factory in Germany, actually. It's kind of done in a very light version for large companies at Google who say, yeah, you can come in late if you want, if you stay later. That's a very light version of trying to match someone's working patterns to their natural sleep patterns. But I think this is a real challenge to us to think about how can we actually think creatively to build this initially in a limited way into how we design rotors. And we do now have um, what we've called kind of biomathematical model shift scheduling where it is designing rotors around understanding of human biology, what rest facilities are available, what the working schedule is, how much sleep has someone had when they turn up to work, what's their normal sleep duration, and I'll add into that chronotype. If we build all that into rotors, we can predict when the peak fatigue times will be, when the greatest risk for fatigue related errors will be. These are used more commonly in high risk industries like aviation, rail, transport. There's been some sort of initial feelers put out in the NHS about how they might work, but I feel this is a real opportunity um, to work with the organisations and companies that are producing these models to see how we can make them fit for purpose in the NHS. Because if we can remove a lot of the issues at the front end, that saves us from having to 
kind of repair the damage that can be done um, if we let staff continue to work at dangerously fatigued levels. I just want to highlight here when we're talking about moving now to proactive strategies, of course, sleep education and habits, understanding your own sleep habits is really important, but we need to have systems of identification when someone has developed insomnia or chronic sleep um, problems. So we need to make sure um, our staff wellbeing services and our occupational health services are not just looking for kind of shift work related disorders, but are kind of looking, thinking more preventatively about is there an opportunity to, uh, to intervene earlier. And of course, we need to bring into this mix the big long list of health problems that can disrupt sleep, sometimes in incredibly profound ways. I've listed some there that we also saw in our own study, so chronic pain, musculoskeletal conditions, um, I'll flag menopause there, which can have an incredible disrupting effect on sleep quality. And as I'll show you just at, when we wrap up the talk, the very strong link between sleep disruption and depressive anxiety disorders. But again, we, we can't just be pushing out um, leaflets and resources as websites as important as they, are, as they are. We need to back this up with help for actual behavior change among staff. There are already some excellent, very evidence-based, psychological-based programs um, for intervening with sleep and changing behaviors and trying to um, tackle the sort of root causes of why someone is sleeping poorly. But they do need some modification to fit shift workers because some of the strategies you would use, like get up at the same time every day, they simply don't work for shift workers. So we should see more of this being promoted to NHS staff and we certainly saw Sleepio being promoted during the pandemic, but we need to make sure these become embedded features in how we support staff sleep health. And I wanna add another approach into the mix here. This is something we got um, quite interested about, how we can get kind of new technologies from sleep science to complement these behavioral approaches um, the kind of cognitive behavioural approaches to sleep. We noticed in our sleep smart study, so our study with our um, ambulance workforce, that two thirds of study participants were reporting a circadian disruption. So they have a mismatch between the sleep they're able to get um, and what their natural biology wants. Of course, with shift workers, you're going to see this. We can try and fix shifts as much as we can, but I feel that's kind of a longer term agenda. What we do have access to is an intervention that's been around for decades, has a very strong evidence base, and that's bright light therapy. And it can start working really, really quickly in a matter of three to four days. It can be ambient light, so changing the, the light on a ward, for example. You can sit next to a lamp, or what we got interested in was new wearable technology. So you don't have to have that ambient light, you can basically take your sunshine with you um, and help kind of reset um, your sleep system by using these wearable bright light technologies. So disclaimer, I have no financial interest, interest in these companies at all. This is just a technology that has come out of a sleep psychology lab, has now been commercialized and it's really available. You can buy these on Amazon. I'd be really curious in the Q&A if any of you have tried it. But these devices, and this is just one example that's on the market, they have good evidence in clinical settings. That's from adolescents right up to older adults. This technology is now moving into workplaces and homes. It's been trialled in warehouse staff in the UK and by Australian nurses while at work, which I think is fascinating. Not sure that that would necessarily fly in the NHS. Should we be thinking about how we can promote these technologies more widely and what do we need to consider to make them work? There's a lot of reasons why this is a really, I think, exciting potential candidate intervention. Not only is it kind of directly working um, on your circadian system, but it does have a direct effect on mood via serotonin and other neurotransmitter pathways. So again, when we finish looking at this really strong link between sleep and mental health, here's an intervention that is available, that is, that is evidence-based, that does work quickly, but we don't know whether this is actually going to work with the types of schedules we have in the NHS, whether people will be comfortable to sit there wearing their glasses over breakfast, or even whether we should be promoting this to be worn uh, while someone's um, taking a break at work or worn on ward um, as they were doing in the Australian study. Would you wear it while you're at work? 
we had one participant when we were getting some initial um, reactions to this technology basically said, I will do anything to sleep better. So yes, please. And I think that reaction would not be uncommon. Now we're moving to sort of our third line of defence. And this is the area where the NHS, I think, is making a real and genuine effort. And that's thinking of ways to help minimise risks while at work when someone either turns up fatigued or develops fatigue. As I mentioned, we really do need to think about a culture shift in terms of some of the actions that are evidence-based. And I keep coming back to NAPS because I think this is really important. There's been some great inroads made in acute hospitals. What are we going to do for staff who work long hours or long shifts in people's homes, in the ambulance sector, in other community-based settings where there's no ready access to a nap room? How can we try and provide these sorts of evidence-based strategies to where our staff are working? And as I mentioned, we really need to bring patient service users and the public with us on this one, because some of these fatigue mitigation strategies are visible to the public, and we need um, the general public to understand why this is okay, why staff are doing it, that it's helpful, that it helps them provide safer care, and is also promoting the health um, of staff as well. And I think when we've had our initial conversations with this, people really get on board with it because it, they understand it and they make sense. But if you see it without that context, um, it can be a little disconcerting to see staff napping. So what about bringing in some of the technologies that have been developed or approaches in other countries into the NHS? And I'm just using one example here because it came from an ambulance sector. And this is one of the approaches that we looked at in our study to say, can we bring this into the NHS? Self-assessment of fatigue is a tricky one because a tired brain is a very poor judge of its own tiredness. So these self-assessment approaches that are simple, very quick to implement, simply rely on adding up how much sleep you've had in the past 48 hours. So in this example, we've got how much sleep did you have in the past 24 hours? I had four hours. How, what about the previous 24 hours? Well, I had seven hours. So that's only 11 hours sleep in the past 48 hours, which is not a lot of sleep. And then we take into account how long have you already been awake when you turn up to shift. On the surface, this is a really simple tool to help staff judge their own alertness when they turn up for shift that doesn't rely them trying to judge their own alertness or doesn't rely them wearing some kind of monitoring um, device, although they are a very good uh, complement to these types of strategies. But it's what do we do with that information? This approach relied on the person doing their self-assessment and then if they were in the dangerous fatigue levels because they're severely sleep deprived, they're required to take action, to nominate, um, to tell them that duty manager that they're unsafe. If they're in sort of a moderate range of risk, the system's encouraging them to tell their workmate, their crewmate, whoever they're working with on shift, to say, look, I'm in a little bit of the, the mid-range danger zone here. Can you keep an eye on me? Promoting those sorts of conversations, I think, are really important, but are, again, kind of quite challenging. So we took this approach um, to our ambulance staff and asked them what they thought of it. Not surprisingly, responses were quite mixed, but we did get quite a lot of favourable responses. And I, I liked these two. One said, I don't know if what I am feeling is normal for the job. I think it would work as it would give people perspective. I think that's so important for people to be able to kind of benchmark where they are. Another participant said, I would love to see something like that, that acknowledges if you're kind of in the dangerously fatigued zone and that managers would be able to look at that and you have some sort of way of telling someone formally that you don't feel safe on shift. But then of course we had the response, well, once you have a system, um, people will try and game it. They'll just say, oh, I'm not safe for work, so therefore, you know, I don't have to come in or I need to be redeployed to some other role. There could be a risk with that, but I think the way you have these conversations with your staff, thinking about these approaches, you would try and minimise any of that. So I would kind of rate this as has promise, but we still need a, lo a lot of work to do to understand whether this would make sense in the NHS. So kind of bring this all together and start to wrap up. The way th we think we kind of need to go forward is to ask ourselves three key questions. What is the latest in sleep science telling us we what we should be doing? 
What is done in other high-risk industries that we can try and import into the NHS? The flip side of that is what is currently being done. We have some fantastic innovation of staff-led, staff-driven initiatives for staff to support each other on shift when they're feeling fatigued or feeling like they're becoming dangerously tired. We need to capture what's being done in a station, on an individual ward, in a care home, to understand how we can know why it works, to amplify it out, amplify it out to other settings, but critically for me, understanding who is it working for and who isn't it working for, because we need to think that not everyone's going to have necessarily equal access to all of these things that we could be promoting or rolling out with, within the NHS. So who are we leaving behind in this and making sure that there's equitable access to whatever we're doing? And of course, that all important cultural change around this. And I'll come back to, we'll get that change um, by bringing our communities and the public with us so that they're just as loud a voice as we are about demanding change in the NHS, that it's not acceptable that we have 70% of staff turning up on shift fatigued, not really acceptable given what we know from other industries to not have fatigue management policies in this day and age and really trying to get at the root causes of why we seem to have this inertia, not everywhere, but in certain settings for real and genuine change in making work safer for both staff and patients. Okay, to wrap up, Mental Health Awareness Week. Why is sleep so important to talk about in Mental Health Awareness Week? Again, coming back to the data from our own, our own study with an ambulance workforce, disrupted sleep is a key symptom for depressive and anxiety conditions. So let's look at this data from our study participants. If staff reported symptoms related to post-traumatic stress disorder, moderate or severe generalised anxiety disorder, moderately severe or severe depression symptoms, or if they had thoughts of suicide or self-harm. Virtually all of these people had poor sleep, and this is clinically significant levels of disrupted and poor sleep. So whenever you're thinking about promoting the mental health of your workforce and thinking about things you can do, thinking about how to support staff who've already developed mental health challenges or conditions, you need to be thinking about sleep. I think we've done a fantastic job getting the conversation about mental health in the NHS and learners and social care out there. But I think we need to start be having a parallel conversation of sleep as well, because there's an enormous beneficial impact we could have on staff if we made support for sleep more widely available, just like we're doing um, for other mental health interventions. And just to finish with a really exciting area, I think that we can capitalise on as well when we're thinking about health and social care workforces. There's emerging evidence that disrupted sleep isn't just a symptom of mental health conditions, but it may actually be a precursor or an early warning sign. We're seeing this across the life course from adolescents right up to older populations who may be at risk of developing dementia. We may actually have a preventative opportunity by intervening with sleep early. And if we're thinking about where can we make the biggest impact on that, let's have a look at our health and social care workforces where we already know we've got a workforce with disrupted sleep in shift workers and day workers and where staff are actively looking for help, whether it's through technologies or programs or receiving help for other health conditions that are impacting on their sleep. So I feel like we've got kind of a real window of opportunity here. So quick take home messages. Poor sleep and fatigue was a problem pre-pandemic. It's almost certainly got worse during the pandemic, but what kind of world are we facing when we come out the other end? Please think beyond shift workers and frontline. Don't forget trainees and your newly qualified professionals. If this is all new to you about managing a run of nights, what are we doing to prepare them and support them while they begin to adapt to this way of working? We have some wonderful models we could implement, what we call sort of an aviation style um, to fatigue risk management. Can we, should we try and transform the NHS in this way? And again, sustainable change needs us to bring our communities with us. And I will finish there.
thank you very much. Thank you so much, Christy, for a really thought provoking and and, and, and stimulating lecture and, and areas that I had not personally uh, been aware of or thought through in any 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 great detail. Uh, we, we know of the importance of circadian rhythms for our health and, and well-being and and therefore sleep hygiene becomes so important for for, for uh, preventing a, a variety of, of human conditions. But how 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 we can actually work with through the things that you talked about, the predictive, the proactive, the reactive ways to actually intervene and, and to promote better sleep hygiene that, that, and, and from a, a societal and, and an organizational institutional um, uh, way, I think is is really exciting and and, uh, and 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 gives us a great opportunity really for health for the future for 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 all of us really and for the the organizations that we work for. And uh, clearly, you know, I mean, uh, uh, having a, a vibrant, healthy NHS workforce that is absolutely essential for for the health of the nation. So, so if we can fix that, then we can fix a lot of other things in in society too. So, uh, um, we're going to move to some questions, but before we do, I'd like to make a small request for all of us, please. So, we'll email everyone who's registered for tonight's event with a link to a short evaluation survey. We'd be very grateful if you take a few minutes to complete the survey, which will help us to plan for future events, both online and in person. Um, so we've now got the opportunity to ask Christy any questions, and I've got a few uh, coming up too. So, so to ask a question, please use the Q&A feature, and depending on which device you're, work, you're watching from, uh, you'll either find this in the right hand side under the small icon with a sweet speech bubble containing a question uh, or under the, a small icon on with a speech bubble containing a question mark. Sorry, uh, we may not be able to get to every question, but we'll do our, our best to pose as many as possible to Christy before we wrap up. If we do run out of time, don't worry, there'll be an opportunity to continue the discussion on Facebook. You can find out more information in the announcements. So questions. So a handful of hospital staff now allow staff to use their breaks at night for micro sleep, which might be a good step forward. But I'm not but I'm interested to know why you think the NHS is yet to develop fatigue policies to support staff and maintain patient safety. So I think what we've got is very, very patchy examples of best practice and by and large it's concentrated in our hospitals at the moment. So if we think about these kind of aviation style uh, approaches to fatigue management, um, nowhere does one of these exist in the NHS yet because they are comprehensive. There's a lot that goes into implementing them. It's not just things like allowing naps as important as that is. It's kind of the whole system, whole person approach to minimizing risk and promoting good sleep. And we're kind of not there yet. But I think we do need to acknowledge and promote where there is good practice and work out how we can actually make it work in other settings. So I gave the example of um, the ambulance sector where when we did a review to see have we got any fatigue management policies. In England, there were none. Um, we asked for all policies and they just didn't exist. Um, we do now know that the Scottish Ambulance Service have developed an absolutely fantastic fatigue management policy drawing on uh, models used in aviation. So it can be done. Um, you just need to get that kind of political will with an organisation to ask the hard questions, uh, to acknowledge that the way we ask staff to work can be dangerous and to have the confidence and transparency with your staff to take on those conversations and have a shared approach to developing solutions. And that's what we see works really well. You need the top level support of political and policy will behind you but you need to allow small teams to innovate and do what works for them. Just as a follow up to that, from for my own standpoint, I mean, are we, do we stoke the problems ourselves with our 
um, the, 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 the way we insist on 12 hour shifts, for instance. So this, this seems counterintuitive in many ways that we're adding workload and stress onto, onto things. Is, is, is this potentially part of the problem in itself? Absolutely. It's kind of one of the, the really challenging conversations that need to be had because many staff like to get their long shifts done in a shorter number of days. And that's kind of their, their right to sort of request that. We've also got the issue of staff then pinky, picking up bank shifts. So they may have already done sort of three nights in a row and then are free um, to get some extra money by then take, picking up some, some bank shifts as well. And we kind of allow that even though the person at that point may be moving into dangerous levels of fatigue. So that's why we kind of need to have this uh, collective conversation about whether we're all willing to accept that and whether there's a better way to change. And we actually have a beautiful example um, from South Central Ambulance Service actually, who worked with their staff to ask this question and they've moved away from 12 hour shifts overnight where at the beginning they just never thought that would be possible but when they sat down with staff went through the science about what the impact is what it means for them for patient safety um, people could see that there would be advantages over time for moving away from these from these potentially dangerous shift patterns that, that's so forward thinking i think that's really really fantastic it's like the issues around education and trying to get teenage teach teenagers later in the day because that's part of their natural biorhythms etc exactly. so anyway I, I, i've got a, a question come here for any research suggestions to make healthcare workers commutes and access to housing near a work easier it's a big one hmm. Would love to be able to have an easy answer to that but i think it has, is actually really really important because we asked about commute time in our study um, and we did find that many staff are working um, quite a distance from where they're based and there are many reasons why if you work for an ambulance service you don't want to be living next door um, to the ambulance service you want a bit of distance between your private life and your work life but it is a real issue that we need to acknowledge i'm not sure we've we've got a solution unless we start prov providing more housing for nhs staff close to where they work which is a brilliant idea but yeah. yes we'll add that to the long list of policy requests <laughs> what that yes. then means is we need to find ways to help staff um, monitor when they feel like they're dangerously fatigued after shift, provide somewhere safe for them to have a nap before they drive home. Um, so we can think about it creatively in terms of what are we actually doing to help colleagues support each other to recognise it, but also to have some kind of organisational approaches and oversight of this as well. Right, okay. Um, does sleep disru disruption in shift workers contribute to illicit risky drug use? That was one of the questions here. You have see any correlations there? Yeah, excellent question. So yes, there there is evidence that obviously stimulant substances um, are used to stay alert. The survey we did was anonymous deliberately because we were trying to capture all of the sorts of behaviours that staff might be doing to stay alert on shift. We only had a small proportion of staff volunteering that information that they were using illicit substances, but it's actually as equally as strong effect going the other way, um, using these substances and alcohol use as well is contributing to poor sleep quality and turning up on shift um, fatigued. So we kind of need to think of it in both directions. Right, right. Yeah, R Richard Pearson actually asked a question, but it's very like the one I posed you about. It says the transport and airline sectors would never accept shift lengths that you've mentioned today. Why don't we include the public in this question now and saying, OK, you know, we want to protect our NHS. Let's uh, how do we do that? Absolutely. Couldn't couldn't agree more. And we, we've been having a um, a conversation for for nearly a year now about how we bring everything, everyone to, the, to have this conversation. So bringing in people from aviation, um, from transport, general public, patients, people who design rotors. Um, we can get together and nut this out and that's the next bit of work that we'll be doing, which I think will be really exciting because there are some things we could do, but actually making them work in a sustainable way, as we know with any sort of challenging change, um, mm -hmm. needs everyone behind it. Yeah. Um, there's a question from Anonymous uh, saying, I've found in the paramedic profession it can be easier to sleep due to the 
crew rooms at ambulance stations and fire police stations, along with the protected 30 minute break, which sometimes extended to significantly more on a quiet night pre pandemic. Is that 30 minutes better than no sleep? Definitely. And actually, we would encourage the sleep to be around about 20 minutes because otherwise you risk going into what's called sleep inertia, which is waking up with a groggy head. You know, you wake up suddenly and you don't know where you are or what time it is. Um, so certainly there is actually a reasonable evidence base that these shorter naps do help improve alertness and reduce risk of uh, critical incidents or kind of safety incidents at work. So it is something we should be promoting more. Coming back to the ambulance sector, when we were kind of scoping out the types of strategies we might use, the, the diversity and acceptance, even within an, a single ambulance trust, let alone looking across different ambulance trusts in napping, even on your break, we had one site where it was encouraged. There was a beautiful dimly lit area with couches where staff were said, please go and have, have, a, have a little power nap on your break. To the opposite end, um, where the, the local manager was going around waking up people who were caught napping on their break because it That's wasn't right. tolerated in, in that station. So we do have a job to bring everyone on board with the value of napping. But I mean, organisations like, you know, Critical Medis Medical Association is really behind this. The NHS has put money into rest and sleep facilities in hospitals. Let's kind of have some parity of access to these sorts of approaches beyond the acute hospitals. Yeah, you said it actually leads nicely to the to the next question. It's quite a long one. As our hospital has increased the rest space available for doctors, this was mainly driven by COVID, as more space was needed for social distancing during breaks. The issue is many doctors are unable to use these spaces on night shifts for rest. Some rotors are staffed at a bare minimum, meaning the opportunity for a substantial break is minimal. When questioning as to if there's if there can be more staff, we are informed there aren't enough doctors and no funding for new doctors, especially especially trainees. Do you feel this needs to be tackled more centrally at the government level, especially college level, the funding and staffing is an issue? So sort of linking staffing and training to actually having enough staff to be able to, to allow people that downtime to, to go forward. Absolutely. It could have been on every slide. Adequate staffing, adequate staffing, adequate staffing. It's kind of, we have enough trouble talking about fatigue, let alone, well, you know what, adequate staffing would make everyone's life better. So, of course, you're absolutely right. That overlays everything here because the situation would most definitely improve if we had safe staffing levels because it will then allow staff to actually have a break for one and then if they choose to do so and need it, to have a short nap while on break. But at the moment, when we have systems under pressure, we, we're not even getting staff having breaks. I'm sure there are some people listening who are thinking, gee, I'd, I'd love to be able to regularly have a break on, on a 12 to 14 hour shift, but it just doesn't happen. It, you know, I think it's, it's, it's really important. Um, we're seeing increased levels of burnout in, in colleagues in the NHS all the time and, and, and people who, a, a, a lot of effort is, is spent in, in developing them, training them to go into the NHS and then after a few years, just simple exhaustion uh, 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 causing them to leave. And, and so finding ways that people can have enjoyable, long, productive careers that are paced rather than this sort of, you know, do your 12 hour shifts and then and, and, uh, and, and, and the sort of, I don't know, it's a sort of more macho culture in some ways of, of uh, having to live in that way. I mean, some of the numbers you talked about there about the 78% having disrupted sleep and 69% severe fatigue going in. I think these are really, these are wake up, <laughs> forgive the pun, but they're wake up calls to, to, to action really um, for us. So um, are there any other questions that are coming through? Have, uh, have we got any, any others in there? Oh, no more questions. No, Rachel is saying, saying no more. Uh, a comment. There is a comment. Uh, so his comment is, I remember uh, being a nurse, a nurse being sacked in the 1990s for sleeping on the unpaid break. We really do need to look after staff and support them taking their breaks. Absolutely, it really is essential, I think. And that's, that's a part of what the outcome of, of Christie's very important research that could have major major impact on society more broadly as 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 well as we as um, we we 
grow and develop the NHS that we all need, really. So, so um, thank you all, really, for for joining us th this this evening. Um, if if you'd like to continue the conversation tonight, or to take the opportunity to network with other attendees, please head to our Facebook event discussion using the link we posted in the announcements. And if you enjoyed tonight's lecture, there's also the link a link to sign up for our monthly What's On email uh, newsletter, which will keep you up to date on future public events from UEA. But for now, thank you very much for participating and thanks again, Christy, for a, a really wonderful and stimulating lecture that I think has given us a, a lot of hope that the future can be uh, brighter, uh, but also a lot to, to, to concern us for what, what we're doing at the present time. Thank you so much, Christy. Thank you. Good evening and sleep well, everyone. <laughs>